I just loved your show last week. Oh, uh, I be... loved your show last week. So many people say to me, you know, I'm your biggest fan, but you really are. I really am. <laughs> I really am. I mean, it's impossible to, I mean, I would love you anyway, but but like, of course, you know, especially someone like me who's been denied so much of my deserved appropriate, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever recognition in this industry by the mainstream establishment. Well, so you know, like, when the, the, I'm kind of small potatoes. When the small, but yeah, but when the smarter people appreciate what you do, I love it, it makes it, you know, and I do. I pray so appreciate that you appreciate it. Oh my God, it's just, I. It was so and, good. And you do know that um, <laughs> I'm constantly saying to people when they say, did you see this like on, you know, some cable news? And I'm always like, no, I get all my news from TMZ. <laughs> they must go wait, crazy. Wait a second. And they think I'm kidding. And of course, I'm not kidding. Because like I gave up cable news pretty much. I still like Jake Tapper, but very few. Uh, I, I, like That the, was a good interview, too. That was a great oh, interview. Oh, that CNN. was a great interview. Yeah. No, he's a real newsman. But I loved seeing you on the other side of it. That was... I used to do it all the time with Larry King. You know, I used to do it when Larry King was... I don't remember you doing that. Oh, I did it a million times. Did you still... You must not have watched Larry King. You I must, hosted for Larry... I was the uh, guest host for a long time. You, you couldn't have watched it every night. I must. I have, didn't watch it every night. I must have done it... It became like what The Tonight Show was for me in the 80s. Like something I would do four or five times a year. It was a real presence, and he would always give me the full hour. Uh, he, huh. to, he told me they always doubled, it always doubled their ratings, so that was good. They went from like a million to two million or something. Yeah. But that was like a big, uh, I love that. You were so, it was uh, so, it was so good. But, you know, <laughs> but it is so funny that I feel like I, I saw Sam Harris say that he recently gave up Twitter, you know. Right. And he was like, I need, did it for my psyche. You know, and I totally understood that, even though I'm not someone who's ever been on Twitter, really, a little bit. I used to tweet until it became like, oh, my God, anything fun you would say, they'd cancel you. Right. For, so what the fuck am I using this? But the fact that he was like, I gave up Twitter and my psyche is so much better. I'm, I was kind of that way with cable news. I am so much happier getting it from you. And I feel like you I, and your crew- I get it. Have a way, of course, it's not the only news I get because you don't cover the kind of things I have to cover in depth. But as far as TV, yes, I read different things. But I, I feel like I'm getting what the, the broad audience of the country, because you do hit on topics that are not just celebrity stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're no. We're, I mean, we're like a pop culture. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly brand. this. The Vanderpump did whoever the fuck they are did this or this one did this. But you know, along the way, and then there are op opinions. I mean, like we did the Alec Baldwin case today. Right, but that's celebrity. I mean, that's not Ukraine got a drone shot. But down. you know what's interesting? It is celebrity, but it's there are issues that make people care about things they otherwise wouldn't care about. That if right. it's Joe Schmo, but like the Alec Baldwin case is bullshit. It is I, a I bullshit, ridiculous uh, prosecution where they're just grabbing headlines. Yes. It is outrageous said, they I, charged him. I know. I, we, we almost always agree, <laughs> which is great. Outrageous that they, they charged the same. him. Well, yes. I mean, like I, I would just put it this way. Do you think Alec Baldwin purposely shot the cinematographer? If no, then what are we talking about? No, 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 about? that's not true. You can have a manslaughter case, which this is, you know, with the armorer, where somebody engages in reckless conduct and they don't intend to kill, but they, are, they can be convicted of manslaughter. So you don't have to prove there's I think an... that's ridiculous too. No, it's not. Either, either it's a... Either it's a, a uh... What if you get in the car drunk? And you drive in. Drunk is different. No, it's not. It's it's still manslaughter. But that should be okay. <laughs> well, you're the lawyer. It's manslaughter. I, I know, but it okay. That should be different than what Alec Baldwin did, because Alec Baldwin is not the same thing as getting drunk, where you have culpability. But you, he didn't do anything. They charged the armorer with manslaughter, right? She's the expert. She's yes. the one. So so if you're charge, if you're saying the expert had the duty, why does an actor have to? Double check their work. I, it doesn't I, make any sense. We're agreeing on that I part know. of it. Well, I'm talking about the legal part of it. And by the way, what I think happened was 
they were so concerned about fucking COVID masks. That's my theory. I'm just pulling this out of my ass, but it could be true. What do you mean? I think that, you know, everyone, it's so typical of how America reacts to everything, wrong. You know, always scared of the wrong things. And they could have been so uh, apoplectic about everything COVID and this <laughs> germs on this set that they uh, therefore forgot about the bullets and the gun. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I mean, if I was rewriting this as a play, that's what I would do to make to make that point about where I, what I think America um does when it has confronted with a crisis. But on the legal point, come on, don't you think getting drunk means you have some, you, you that's an action you took and then got in your car right. versus just an honest mistake that, that should not be manslaughter. Well, no, but uh, we agree on Alec Baldwin, but if somebody gets in a car drunk, right. Yeah, drunk. and they, and and they're that's reckless, and they kill somebody. Right, that's the precisely what manslaughter is. Right, I guess that I would call that like f fourth degree murder. Is there such a thing? No, well, that would be because it would be like yes, it's murder, but you in no way directly intended to do it. But you knew you could maybe murder <laughs> by doing this stupid thing. So and can we can we talk about law today? Because I feel like I need the upper hand on something. Yeah. <laughs> That's There's okay. no upper hand. I mean, you have that background in law, which I think is also great on your show because <laughs> not that you need an extra dimension to be smarter than those kids you work with. Oh, stop it. What? I wa they're great. Okay. See, this is where you and I disagree on something. I, we don't disagree as much as you think. I think we do. Okay. You have a lot of contempt. <laughs> uh, that what I have contempt for is that they don't know, when they don't know something and you do, their attitude is, oh, dad, what an asshole, you know things. Like you're the asshole because you know something and they don't. Whereas a, a, a more, um, I feel like uh, humble generation would be, I feel like this is the way we were. It's like, oh, if I don't know something, I'm the idiot. You know, that all that generation does is, uh, I wasn't born for that. You know, even if you mention a movie, I wasn't born. Yeah, that's why we put it on celluloid. I disagree with you, man. Well, I'm watching it every night. Every so I'm a little bit older than you, but I, you probably know this. During the Vietnam War, there was a mantra in my generation. And you know what that was? We are the same generation. Well, what was the mantra? Make love, not war. Well, that was one. <laughs> Don't trust anyone over 30. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, well, what's the difference? I mean, it, you know, that's the rite of passage with young people, that they have contempt for, look, it's not like we did a great job with this world. And so they're looking at what was left to them. And I did that when, during the Vietnam War, thinking, how could they lead us down this path? And, we, and that mantra was real. That was not just a thing. It was uh, it was real, at Bill. I think that's a bullshit thing. It was. Every, no, that every generation, they left us. You know, every generation does what they can. They're living their lives. They're, they're probably doing the best that they can, given whatever the circumstances are. Do you think we're better off today than we were, uh, say, 30 years ago? Well, let me tell you something, President Carter. <laughs> we're, we're, better off, <laughs> we're better off when you lose your job. And that's... <laughs> no, I just... I mean, I, better off... It's, uh, it's, first of all, whatever the answer to that is, it doesn't matter because there were so many other factors that came along that were not uh, something that any generation can control. Most of history, I think, is, first of all, dictated by the technology. It's not even in our control. You know, they were going to get rid of slavery, and then along came the cotton gin. Somebody invented the cotton gin, and it made slavery incredibly profitable. Okay. So humans reacted the way humans usually react. But there are human judgments that people make and choices that people make. And I could understand why somebody 30 years old who is looking at a pipe dream of buying a house or, right. oh, I, I or, or worrying about whether the world will even last. And who are they going to blame? They're not going to blame their contemporaries because they weren't the ones in charge. There are people in charge of things. Even, you know, despite technology, people are in charge of things and they're older people. So the way they look at us Honestly, it's kind of the way I look and, at uh, people who got us into the Vietnam War. 
Okay, well, that was that our, that really wasn't our generation. That was my generation no, because when no, I was. No, it wasn't. It was, that was the World War II generation. They were the ones in charge. Kennedy, Nixon, Johnson, those are people who were World War II people. Kennedy served in World War II. So did Nixon, who prosecuted that but war. But isn't more the than principle anybody. the same? Well, you're, you're, you're blaming a former generation, but it, it is not our generation. You're a baby boomer. I'm a baby boomer. That's the greatest generation. They're different. But so they're different can, in our eyes, but they're them. not necessarily different in the eyes of like my staff that is looking but again, at. Then they don't know things. They, you know, then they're ignorant because generation, if we're talking about generations, we should not lump them all together. Then why don't we lump us with the millennials? Then because we're did, but, different but, but generations. we said don't trust anyone over 30. That is a sweeping statement. Well, it was as stupid then as it is now. <laughs> It was stupid. <laughs> yes, because everyone... It didn't feel stupid then. Because you were under 30. Okay, well, my staff is, a lot of them are I'm, under 30. I'm saying, and when you're in your 20s, you're basically an idiot. I look at back, back at what I was thinking and doing in my 20s, and I go, what a fucking idiot. I've said this before here. If Even at this age of 67, if you asked me, would you, in a... If you, Jeannie said you can go back and be 25 again, would you do it? I would say, no if I still had to have that brain in my head, because I know all the pain that's gonna come from being that dumb. If well, I could go back knowing what I do now, <laughs> yes, that would be a fantastic but deal. You say, you say dumb, and maybe they don't have the historical knowledge that we have just because of the fact that we've lived a lot longer, but I will tell you, and I, I mean this, there is no way TMZ would be successful if this were, we're all talking, in my head. We're talking about two different things. Well, we're not I, really. We they are. have a skill set. You're, you're, you're expanding this one area that I'm uh, focusing in on with that generation, with, with the people who you work with, who are very likable. I don't dislike these people. I watch them every night. <laughs> if I didn't like them, I wouldn't like. I wouldn't watch every show every night. Um, but you're trying to expand this in a way that is, I don't think, valid. Yes, they have that generation has a tough time economically. I get it. They also have uh, the future there for them to take. The one good thing that's still left about America is that you can make your own way and you can reinvent yourself. That's true. Tomorrow. That's true. You did it. I did it. It's still available for them. And they do seem, um, I, I feel for them when they talk about lives that don't seem happy. But, you know, my life wasn't terribly happy in my 20s either, because that's the decade you're spending where you're trying to establish yourself. Of course, it's a harder grind. You're in the infancy of your adulthood. When that was you, my favorite decade. What? My 20s. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Your favorite? It was my favorite because, I mean, you know, wow. I, Not I, me. I got out of law school and I went down to Miami and I taught law school and I, I just felt like the, and I made 11,500 bucks and I felt rich and I was experiencing all these new things as an adult. It was magical for me. I loved my 20s, loved my 20s. It's so interesting. I always thought we agreed on everything. We don't agree on anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do. We do. <laughs> I think we and do. And I so appreciate it. You're, you're like my patrone, really. I mean, I feel like I, I don't understand it because I, I'm I do, because when because TMZ will like put my shit up there in you know I, whoever edits that does a fine job. Uh, I do that one personally. Oh, see. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there you go. Not trusting the millennials are. Um, well, no, it's not, no, I just get up earlier. Than I now. know. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. It's past your bedtime now. It's only quarter. You're right. You're right. Um, but uh, no, but it, you know, it really has a lot of people who would never be aware of my show. Some people don't even get HBO. Kids don't watch TV. They don't watch TV. They, that's not their thing. You know. Well, and, okay, I'm, I, you know, there are. There's going to be a. A huge sea change because all these cord cutters, you know, now that it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right. you know, what's cable is in some trouble over this. It really is. And I think, you know, social media is so dominant. I, I was stunned during the uh, Johnny Depp trial that uh -huh. that was that opened my eyes and I realized people were getting their news from TikTok. And yes, yes. it was biased and it was skewed. 
That's where it came from. Know, now that I get my news from TMZ, it's, it's it like, feels like a Wall Street <laughs> Journal now, right? <laughs> that's exactly that's right. What I'm saying. No, that's compared exactly to, right. <laughs> compared to getting it on TikTok. Oh, no, you're right. You're fucking Walter no, Cronkite. <laughs> See, that's what I, I totally not, not, to, not to go back, not to go back to this thing, but I do want to go back to this thing. I guess I do about your crew. I don't dislike them, but like know, if, 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 if I said Walter Cronkite or you said it, they would have no they'd idea. be like, who's that? And you tell them and they'd be, roll their eyes like, oh, knowing things. And that's so old. It's like that bugs me, you know? Uh, they, you know, can I tell you something funny that they did? Today? Well, I heard one, one of them said one day, uh, why would you ever read a book? Okay, th that he's an outlier. Her, <laughs> it was her. Okay, she's an outlier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess there's two of them. <laughs> well, sometimes though, I, sometimes okay. I deserve it. Today, we, it was so funny in the morning meeting. Um, we were talking about a documentary on red on f Cheetos, on flaming Cheetos. It's a, it actually sounds kind of interesting. <laughs> yes. No, there's a big documentary on it. And so I started, you know, I, I pulled a Tuesday with Maury on him and I, um, <laughs> a, 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 and I started telling him a story because I worked in my dad's liquor store um, when I was growing up. And I said, you know, when I, when I was, um, when I was working in the store, there were, you know, they introduced a bunch of new Cheetos. And I remember they, that the, I, this guy came in with this big box and it was the first time I had ever seen Lay's potato chips. They had just come out. And Devin in my office kind of looked at me stunned and said, you're older than chips? <laughs> <laughs> That's a scream. Oh, you know, some of them are witty. Oh, they're uh, really funny. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a few of the guys there are, the, you know, are like, oh, these guys could they're be really like funny. comedy writers, you know. They are good. I guess, and the other thing is that they, I guess I take umbrage because, of course, you know, I've told you this before, the genius of your show is that it's really a family show. You're the paterfamilias. You're the, what's that? <laughs> you're, you're the father, and then you have these kids, and, you know, these darn kids, they're always making fun of you, but you love them, so you put up with it. I but I, but I, of course, I relate to you, duh. <laughs> so, like, they make when they make fun of you or or like really I feel like cruel jokes I feel like you know my thing I'm always saying ageism the last prejudice you can have is ageism they have this terrible attitude about older people like if there's a problem like well that'll be solved when they die Great solution. See, Just w wishing for people to die. Fuck you. Even if I agree with the cause you're talking about. But there's it's a way just, of... There, it's just a bad attitude. There's a total way of diffusing it because I tell oh. them all the time, I want to be cremated. I go through the whole thing no, with them. No, but they talk... And, it, and no, but what it does is it, it disarms them. That if you... F because what they're looking for is a reaction. And if you lean into it and if you say, yeah, and, <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and I'm older than dirt... And but I'm older than chips. But you're not. <laughs> See, that's the other thing that bugs me. They talk about you like you got one foot in the grave. Meanwhile, I feel like you have a much better life than a, first of all, you look great. No, none of us can look like we did when we were 35. But you, I would never guess you're the age you are. You're in better shape than they are. Okay, come on. It's you are. I always used to look at that and I'm like, what is this guy? This is not a competition. Because you... No, but it, it's it's not a competition, but it's relevant to people who are always making jokes about your age, which don't ring true about you. They don't. They, that's the thing. I'm a comedian. I know when a joke rings true. So it's like, yes, is he technically this many years older? But what life is he leading? Is he leading a young life? Does he have a young energy? What about him is betraying this ancient uh, age that he wears? Nothing. I get it. But we also, we <laughs> collaborate a lot. We no. are together all the time. I understand. And, I and, and I really appreciate, I really appreciate how they bring things to the table that I just don't know. Yeah. And, I mean, and it helps shape what I, we do in a big, big, big way. I learn from them also. Yeah. I do. I, I mean, because I, I see, believe you. It's it's a great way to see what that generation, which, look, I have lots of millennial friends, so I do hear about it. But... Yeah, it's it's it. I tell you, it's a great show because again, you're the father, and then you have the kids, and it's that Mary Tyler Moore dynamic where 
they're not really family, but Mr. Grant was really the father. And he, Mary was the daughter. Murray was the brother. I love that show. S right. God, I love that show. What's that show? <laughs> I have no idea. And then you tell them, and no they're idea. like, oh, once again, he knows something I don't know about. What an asshole. Someone who would know something. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this. Okay. I watched your 9-11 thing. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Well, of course. You don't have to thank me. I'm no, I, honestly, I'm so close to it because it, this well, took six months. I love the way it was done, first of all, because it's not long. You don't have to watch. Everything these days is too long. Right. Like, you can, you can say it in an hour, and you do. <laughs> we did. Right. And the premise, I don't know how anybody didn't wasn't all over this for the last 20 years. But it's crazy. That, what is it called? 9-11, the fifth plane? The fifth oh, plane. I mean, that says it all. There was a fifth plane. There's no doubt in my mind after watching this that that absolutely was the fifth plane. There's no law that says, ben, no, we could only have four planes. No, there was probably, there could have been six. There could have been know. six. But there definitely was this one. Because as you show, I don't want to give too much of it away, but, you know, there's four guys and... Of course, these are politically correct terms, so we have to say, of course, not all Arabs or Muslims are terrorists. Yes, we never said differently, but it is just for Arabs sitting in first class. One of them is a man in a burqa. That's what the flight attendant said. Which also would have been a good title. <laughs> the, the man in the burqa. Um, that's what the flight attendant said. There were th three flight attendants we interviewed. We interviewed the pilot. And this was a plane, a uh, United flight that was supposed to take off from JFK at nine in the morning, and it was going to Los Same Angeles. Same time as the other four. Same time. It would have aligned perfectly. And um, there were a lot of things that happened. But ultimately, I, I think the reason this is so stunning that it never came, never really came out is these flight attendants were all interviewed by the FBI immediately. They were The FBI was alarmed. Um, they locked that plane up. Um, after everybody got evacuated, and all of a sudden, people on the ground saw two people running in the plane. The plane yes. had been fully empty, oh. and the authorities came and opened the door, and the hatch that leads from the cabin down to the oh. bottom of the plane and the tarmac, it was open. Somebody they, opened this hatch. They, what the pilot thinks, and what he told me, he... They found box cutters in the plane right next to his, and it Planted was one number in up. in first class. In first class, They've in the seat in the seat pockets. Right. I mean, they did everything but leave a business card that said Mohammed Kablooey. <laughs> well, there, look, here's the thing. There is somebody on the ground that, at least the pilot thinks, that came up into that plane thinking the box cutters were put on that plane, which is right. what the intention was, yeah. and they were trying to look for weapons to get rid of them before anybody searched the plane. No, plainly, that's, I mean, there's no other explanation. The, the FBI took the flight attendants to a lineup to see if they could identify these passengers, and, and it was never mentioned in the 9-11 Commission report. That's, never. That was the most disturbing part of it to me. Um, I mean, what other reason would there be box cutters planted in the in the, the pocket, seat pocket, the seat pocket? In in uh, of course that's what it is. Um, and well, I have two questions. One, any idea where the plane, what the target was? Because my guess is the White House. Well, because if I was planning the big attack with five planes, now you have to think of it in terms of five. Okay, the one that was that crashed in Pennsylvania, that was headed for the Capitol. So you got the Capitol, the Pentagon, the two towers. What else are you going to take out? Mount Rushmore? No. Well, some people think that, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think anybody really knows where the flight in Pennsylvania was headed. It could have been the Capitol, but it could have been the White I, House. I mean, what is, as opposed to what? The Smithsonian, the, the Department of Fisheries and Hatcheries? I, I, no, you're gonna take out the White House. Yeah. So. This plane, by the way, it never took off. It, it got to the runway yeah. and they called it back because at that point, it, it would have taken off, but there was a long line. It was, the pilot said it was the only day, usually it's one or two planes ahead of him, there were 10 planes, and were it not for that, the plane would have been in the air and God knows what would have happened. So do the same people who work on TMZ Vanderpump rules do the do the a show like that? Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. All of them? Not everybody, <laughs> no. I mean we have we, we're doing a lot of documentaries right. now and um we just have a great team and it's a small team, but we're doing a lot of documentaries yeah. and I, I personally well, I love doing these. I, I love you know, it's my passion. 
Club Random is brought to you by the audio marketing gurus at Radioactive Media. If you're responsible for marketing your company nationally, how are you growing your business? Don't just Google and social media. When you can harness the power of audio and video and partner with shows like mine and elevate your brand in a space away from your competitors, the team at Radioactive Media can get you there. They create campaigns airing nationally on podcast, terrestrial, satellite, and streaming radio. Radioactive Media has over 35 years experience in the field of audio marketing, and they can create a customizable campaign for your company's needs, just like they've done for hundreds of great companies, including ones you've seen here, like Signal Wire, Heat Holders, and Wine Enthusiast. Radioactive Media is very hands-on and can craft the appropriate message and track the results using their unique set of analytical tools, ensuring you're on course to generate an ROI as high as five to one. Radioactive is also the first in their field to utilize the power of text messaging. They can show you how to generate up to nine times more leads. You heard me right, nine times more leads. Radioactive Media believes so much in the power of audio marketing, they put their money where their mouths are by using it themselves, right here, right now. For a limited time, receive a $1,000 credit towards your first campaign by going to radioactivemedia.com or text the word RANDOM to 511511. Discover how audio marketing can surpass your current strategies with new and innovative ways that sound better. Go to radioactivemedia.com or text RANDOM to 511-511. Text RANDOM to 511-511 today. Terms, conditions, message and data rates may apply. Let's say you wanted to start a new business and you got some funding and that funding wasn't tied up in a failed bank. How would you go about hiring? Whether you're starting a new business or growing one, if you want it to be successful, you need the most talented people on your team. That's where ZipRecruiter comes in. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash random. ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology finds highly qualified candidates for whatever roles you might have, from over sharing guy in marketing to uptight lady who brings her lunch from home, to hot girl in accounting. Got your eye? on one or two people who'd be perfect for your job, ZipRecruiter lets you send them a personal invite which leads to more applicants. That's right, in today's world, you will practically have to beg people to work. ZipRecruiter also offers attention-grabbing labels that speak to job flexibility, like remote, training provided, urgent, and more, to really help your job stand out. Let ZipRecruiter fill all your roles with the right candidates. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash random. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash random. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Okay, <laughs> it's so natural, these plugs. I'll be at the uh, Paramount Theater in Seattle, April 1st. Oh, I love Seattle. And Sunday, April 2nd at the Arlene Schnitzer Hall in Portland. And Saturday, April 22nd, the theater at MGM National Harbor, Oxon Hill, Maryland. Sunday, April 23rd at the Durham Performing Arts Center. I did a special there once, I love it, Durham, North Carolina. You have to see me do stand up one time. You have to come, you have, we have to go to Vegas together. I wanna go to Hawaii. Uh, I've stopped doing it. Oh no! It was the last year. Oh, you told me I could come to the next one and you quit so I wouldn't go. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know Food Network had podcasts? Be My Guest with Ina Garten is a podcast from Food Network where Ina invites her friends into her East Hampton home for good food and great conversations. This season features Stanley Tucci, Misty Copeland and Laura Linney, and Nora Jones. Get to know Ina and her friends as they share life stories over dinner and drinks in every episode. Stream Be My Guest with Ina Garten on Discovery Plus and check out Be My Guest with Ina Garten wherever you get your podcasts. And apropos of what we were saying before about where TikTok is now, TMZ moves, you know, everything is always in flux in media. Right. And, and TMZ is, I could see that absolutely morphing to a much more mainstream where it wasn't, you know, now it's associated with gossip, but associated with things like this. More yeah. of a, you know, because those two areas lap. We've seen that going back as far as Gary Hart with the Inquirer, that the 
the gossip investigators are sometimes better than the mainstream media investigators, often. Yeah, I mean, we've, I got to say, I mean, at least the goal, whether we've accomplished it or not, but the goal for many years now has really been to not really just do a celebrity website. It's really more of a pop culture website. And we take on, you know, like, you know, we mentioned Alec Baldwin, but there are other examples of, you know, the Jesse Smollett case. And there are like a lot of cases that may have celebrities, but the issues are yeah. really, really important. And I don't think there's this wall between important and pop culture. I think the two really merge a lot, a lot. Well, you certainly get more people paying attention to right. an issue. Right. If it has a celebrity right. attached to it. Well, you know that. I mean, you but, know, it's really funny. But you can't attach a celebrity to every issue that's important. At some point, people are going to have to, if the country is going to last, you know, sort of get on the page that if you're a citizen, you have to have some sort of awareness of what the fuck is going on. Yeah. I mean, it, whether or not Madonna is involved with it. But whose fault is it if they're not? Because I'll tell you, well, one of the things, the thing that bothers me so much is just that depending on what you read and watch now, your worldview is so skewed and fucked up that you cannot do anything but hate people who you disagree with exactly. because the way they present it on both sides is so like tribal that I think that's one of the biggest dangers in this country that, you know, people are getting skewed views of the world and they have such contempt for the other side. You, you talk about this a lot. I'm talking about it Friday night. Right before you came here, I was working on what we're doing Friday night at the end of the show and it's St. Patrick's Day. So it's, you know, it takes off on the idea that for 30 years, political hatred got so bad in Northern Ireland that it became violent hatred. And people had to live with bombings and they had to live with yep. snipers. And I'm not saying that's exactly what's gonna happen here, but they called it the, the troubles. And certainly the, the ingredients are exactly the same because of what you're just saying. When people get to this point, where the hatred is this serious, where you have Marjorie Taylor Greene saying, we need a national divorce. In other words, we can't even talk to you. Yeah. Um, a heated conversation is so much healthier than no conversation at all. You know, yelling and screaming at each other, at least you're talking. Right. I mean, and you know, obviously we're making some hay about the fact that, you know, she's comparing it to divorce, but it's there's a serious point there that people in relationships get to that same place where, you know. Well, so succession it, is divorce. It is divorce, yeah. right. And it's, irre she actually used the term irreconcilable differences. Yeah, that's, yeah. And, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm constantly trying to appeal to that American who's not like that. And I know there's lots of them out there, but it is discouraging when I see the ones who were so indoctrinated. And I see some of this among your crew that I don't think I could, I don't think, Logic cannot get to them. And that's, of course, true of the other side, absolutely. Yeah. That you can't reach them because they believe in this religion of the woke or the religion of Trump, and you can't argue with religion. So, right. I mean, I, I don't know. And then- the Are you hopeful? Not really. I'm not either. <laughs> I'm not either. But it's so funny that the, the cognitive dissonance between how the world is to me, you know, which is not hopeful, and yet my own life, I mean, you said you liked your 20s the best. I like this the best. More in control, more comfortable with who I am, more successful. No, that's all true. I mean, but my, isn't there, isn't, don't you, didn't you get a charge out of the first time you did yes, this? Yes, of first course. Time? There's nothing like yeah, that. That happened twice. Once, <laughs> when, I, when I got laid and when I smoked pot. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, I'm serious. Those are the two things. I know exactly what you're talking about. When you got about. your first car, you weren't more. Well, well I'll, let me add a third one. And the first time I got up on stage and did 20 minutes and got laughs all the way through. Okay. I, I remember the exact date. It was June 20th, 1980. Like 20 minutes. And was I the greatest comic ever? No. But I was a real comic. I, I got up and did a 20-minute set and people actually laughed at everything as they were supposed to. And that was one. Uh, the first first time I uh, like uh, was on stage in high school, that was like I could not sleep that night. I, I did a show like the pop show, you know, the the whatever the talent show we had, and 
I came out of my shell senior year. And, See, and, now I'm starting, there's more than just getting laid and smoking well, okay. pot. Okay, <laughs> I'll give you two or three things. <laughs> but <laughs> smoking pot was one, getting laid was one. Yeah, the first time a girl liked me and the first date was one. Yeah, there was first times that were great, but they're few and far between over a whole, we're talking about 15 years from like 15 to 30. Uh, let, me ask, let me ask you something. Um, when did you get your first house? My first what? House. House. <laughs> No, I didn't say. <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was house. I, I, house. I didn't know what. I, it was a tattoo. Remember when we were going to get this matching tattoos, and someone I heard someone on your show. She's sweet, that blonde girl, Courtney. I, no, the one is getting married, or oh, Charlie. Charlie, yeah. Right. She was like, "Did you hear? They're getting matching tattoos." She really blew. Right, right, right. <laughs> But uh, my first house I bought uh, in, uh, moved in in April of 1986. Okay. Uh, on Orange Grove. It was- Small uh, house? The smallest. I, 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 not, as, not as small as mine. <laughs> not as small as mine. I had a converted trailer that they put really? on, on a lot. Um, actually, not that far from there. Oh. Were you, I was more excited with that little house, that little converted trailer, Sitting on the yes. porch saying, "This is you're it's right." Like all of those things. You're right. You know? You're right about that. You're right. You know that house. Yes, there's something about pissing on your own land. It's the best. And it's like I was 29, I think, when I bought it. And my I remember my rent was like 450 little 450 dollars back then, 1985. And then my mortgage went up to like 1450, and I was shitting in my pants because like, whoa, I just added a grand a month that I have to come up with for rent. And I did, you know, I mean, it was like, okay. And yes, that I remember going up on the roof myself to clean the gutters, like, it's like just, every three months. Those and first things it's that just, you experience yes, as an adult are that's, just that's magic. True. And first, and like the way, yeah, love is, I mean, you know, you probably, uh, it, when it's new like that, it's, it's, yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> You're a little more right than I was. You see? I, but, but, in, but, it, but, but again, those things are not like every day. Whereas like my life was not good every day. There were a lot of days I didn't like, but my life now, there's very rarely a day I don't like. I mean, I got up today and I went to the office. We go once a week now and I had my writer's meeting and I, a writer, how, come, how could I have more fun than sitting around with those brilliant people who I love and kicking around the ideas that are fresh and we're gonna do this amazing show Friday. And you know, and then I come home and I get to write a thing about it and then I get to talk to you. It's like, there's more sometimes cr good stuff crammed in one week in now than there was in a year. You made me like blindly jealous just with, I went to the office, I go to the office once a week. <laughs> Why, you go every day? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, of course. I mean, we're doing the show. Right, yeah. of course. Yeah. And, and well, they're long oh, the hours. office is the, it's Yeah, connect, that's, that's yeah. all the office. So you're in the same places when you're off camera? Yeah, we, it's, that's a working office. We just pull chairs up. I mean, we just pull chairs up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So like, Every time I watch you, it, now I, I I must say my image back in the day was that TMZ was meaner. Am I wrong? Did you not get nicer? I was afraid of you at one point. Well, I think yeah. <laughs> I, I, look, I mean, I, I was actually talking to one of your producers about this. Yeah, I mean, I I think we have changed, and you know, I sometimes look back and think, oh my god, yeah. I mean, I don't know that it's meaner as much as. You know, the, there were lines that were, I guess, more acceptable. But I, but, I feel but like, when I look back, I, I I think, my God, why didn't we corral ourselves more? Yeah, I just feel like you're fans now. You're fans of all of these people. You generally you like them. Yeah, because, I mean, because I like them too. But I mean, we're also know. honest about it. I mean, you know. the, the, what I re what I love is there's not this like singular view of anything, and. I think that's really important. It's kind of what you were talking about earlier that, you know, you can tolerate disagreement. We disagree all the time uh, about things. I love but it. But we have talk, we talk about it all the yes. time. And I love that. I love that. I love that. that. No, that's, that's what makes it real. And the fact that they don't edit 
when they make fun of you. It's great because you, then you do your Jack Benny take. <laughs> 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 yeah, Harvey. <laughs> what was Jesus like? Yeah. <laughs> I don't get a Jack Betty. Thing. No, but you, you, by do, the way, you do. They your, would have you, no idea. They would think course. that's original. Oh. But, which is <laughs> <laughs> right. No, but you do your version of it. I mean, it's it's a it's a take. It's it's Jim from the Office. Okay. I mean, that's why the camera goes there. Okay. That's what they're doing. Okay. The, what's the comedy gold? But like, of all these people who cover, who, who is your favorite celebrity, or do you even have one? Or do share. you even share? And not for the reason you think that I'm gay. What reason do I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot. She's a very big icon. Yeah, I, but that's I, not why. No. You, know, I, I, you know, I have never. I love Cher. I, I've never talked about this. Um, but I'm gonna. Um, this is not a, like a really, ha this is not a happy story, but it has a meaningful ending. Um, back in the eighties, life in the gay community was a nightmare. It was just a nightmare. Um, because, because of AIDS and it, right. I, 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 you know, it's, it, I can't explain this. Now, I, I've tried to explain this a little bit to the staff and it's just hard for people to understand this, but like half my friends died in their twenties and thirties, at least half. I was going to almost a funeral a week and you know, you, you would spend, um, weekends at the Sherman Oaks, uh, <coughs> AIDS ward, um, at the hospital there, um, which was just filled with people and there was no cure. It was a death sentence then. And, um, yeah, so I had a partner, um, his name was Kevin and we were together for almost nine years and he, we didn't get tested for a long time because there was nothing you could do and you just didn't want to live with that hanging over your head. Right. But when they came out with a drug that didn't cure anything, but at least it was something, um, we both got tested and he was positive. And, um, a couple of years later, he got really sick. He developed full-blown AIDS. And it was so ghastly. Um, I, I just can't even, it was, there was just nothing to comfort him medically. It was horrible. And he was a, the best realtor that has ever worked in Los Angeles. And everybody loved him. And he was so successful and so good at it and honest about it. And he had a lot of celebrity clients. So um, one night he was near death. Um, I was at home alone and there was a knock at the door. And I opened the door up and it was Cher. Mm. And, I, and she said, I came to see Kevin. How and did she know? She was a client of his. Uh. But, you know, people talk and she, I guess she knew he was sick. Right. And she said, can I see him? And I said, of course. And I said, you know, I could come upstairs with you because it's kind of rough. And she said, no. She said, I want to go alone. And so she walked up the stairs and she um, closed the door. And I could hear her talking to him. He was in a coma at that point. And, but I think he could process and understand. And I thought, okay, she'd, she'd be there for like five or 10 minutes. She was there for 45 minutes. And she was just talking to him. And she came downstairs afterward and she said, I'm really sorry. And she left. And the reason I'm, that I'm telling you this and why I'm, I'm, so taken by her. She never talked about it. She never had a publicist call and said, I visited somebody with AIDS. She never talked about it. I, I've never t really publicly talked about this. And oh, I'm glad you are. And, and people should know that about her. Absolutely. And I, I am, I, I think so much of her and it was so genuine and, and meaningful. And, you know, I went upstairs after and I could just tell it meant something. I mean, he couldn't talk, but I could see this kind of, it was peaceful. And he died a couple of days later, but um, I will never forget that from her. I will never forget that. So the reason you like her 
really is kind of because it's kind of gay. <laughs> it's kind of gay, but <laughs> no, <laughs> just to break the. Right. That's what they call a treacle cutter on a sitcom. Right. You know, <laughs> the, 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 the eight. Okay, year, you the, got me. No, no, <laughs> but, but you know, on sitcoms, the the eight year old who comes in and says boner <laughs> yeah. commercial, but but no, let me go back because I have. And you can, I just say there's so many celebrities now. That's, who will, you know, use publicists and whatnot to, you know, show good deeds. And it's great that they have good deeds. Hers was just private. She just right. wanted to do it. So, well, first of all, I always thought she was great. Fan of her music, fan of her acting, and just fan of her as a person. You, you could tell she was a ballsy, real chick. I mean, yep. like, I would, I'm not going to get to in this lifetime be friends with her, but I, I bet you we would have been friends if we had been in the same and, and did you ever become friends with her after that? No, I had actually, you know, I mean, th- it was just out of the blue. And um, our paths only crossed once. Really? Um, when Kevin was showing her house to um, this religious sect <laughs> that was looking at the house to buy it. And I'm just thinking, where are these guys getting the money? Now I understand. Um, but um, she um, she was introducing herself to all of the fathers or whatever they were called from this sect that were looking at this $20 million house or whatever it was. And she came down to me and I said, I'm Father Levin. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> and she hit me. Oh. But that was pretty much the only interaction. Well, you know, she got into trouble about I mean, two years ago, maybe. You remember this? She tweeted something. I think it was about the George Floyd murder. I think she, but it was some instance like that. I'm pretty sure that was, and she said, she was just, you know, it was so typical of our cancel culture, or there are, it's called the apology culture, making people apologize when they're only trying to say something good. And you get it slightly wrong or wrong in some person's eyes. And she said something like, I wish I could have been there because I think I could have helped. I'm, oh, I remember that. I'm not saying that's a word for word, I, I but remember it's very this. close to yeah, that. Yeah. That was certainly the sentiment. Yeah. And just, I, for people who don't understand what it's like to be a celebrity, and I'm, I'm saying that not as one myself, as because there's there are levels of it that are so f- <laughs> in the stratosphere beyond where I am, and I'm fine with that. I don't want to be in that stratosphere, but the power that celebrity has in our culture, I'm not so sure a celebrity in that situation couldn't have changed something. People are just moved by celebrity. I don't know if she could have got that sick cop to stop doing what he was doing, but it's not completely unthinkable. But let's say it is. Okay, she made a po- she made a point. You may not like it. She didn't come in from a good, mean place. In good faith. Yeah, in, in, and in it's a like, great place. Let it's it go. Just, you know, it's like that's what when when I rail about woke, that's the kind of shit that I'm talking about that annoys so many people. I know it's not just me. I just hear it all the time, like, Bill, please. And this is from liberals, you know. I hear it too. Everybody hates that shit. It's just mean girls, high school bullshit. But you know what, you know know the problem? The problem is corporate. The problem is big companies that if this were just a couple thousand people on Twitter, you know, going after everybody sitting, you know, sitting at a computer, I don't know that it would matter that much, but the fact is it has caught the attention of big companies that will immediately fire people that will, um, you know, that will, you know, put you in a corner um, because they're so scared of, you know, yeah. the, uh, of, of people on both yes. extremes. So the extremes are running this country, not because right. the public wants it, but all of the the infrastructure and all the people that hire and fire and will rent you an apartment or do whatever, they listen to this and they're scared of it and they react to it. And I think that's why things have gotten out of control. I don't think it's the public, because I agree with you. I don't think the public believes this shit. I think that what what's going on is, is that these companies are so skittish that they're going to get canceled that they'll just cut anybody off if they misstep at all. I really do. All right. I have to go back to one thing about your story. <laughs> about w- Well, I mean, about AIDS. I mean, first of all, I'm sure you saw the thing I did last week on 
Sashin Littlefeather. Mm-hmm. I'm sure your your crew does not know who that is. They or. have no idea. I don't. They they don't know Marlon Brando. To that, your point. <laughs> to your, to I your quite point. Put that in. <laughs> right. Like, he was an actor. That was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> that was hysterical. <laughs> but like, okay, we won't go back to that. But tell them, tell them how big a moment that was, because that was a big moment. Oh, it was a huge. It was moment. just cultural. It was okay. Well, and you, and, and you say, you know, how has TMZ changed? I mean, like you said, they were doing tomahawk chops. And the liberals. Right. Yes, this was liberal Hollywood. I, by the way, I told Quentin Tarantino, he's not going to do it, of course, but I told him, Quentin, you love to remake things, remake real history. Why don't you remake that? Because what I left out of that story, by the way, that the obituary in the New York Times said was not only did they boo her, jeer her, threaten to arrest her if she went over time, <laughs> did the tomahawk chop, John Wayne having to be restrained right. from rushing this day. Well, that, that, I, that I believe. <laughs> listen to this. She takes the award. This is in the obituary. Brings it to Brando's house after the ceremony. On the doorstep, she is shot at. I did not know. Really? That's what they said. Holy smokes. So that's, so I said to Quentin, you should remake this incident, except you love women characters who go on a tear and kill, have her <laughs> shoot at her, and then she <laughs> she kills, like all those Hollywood liberals who are booing her. Kill she, Jill. Jack Lemmon. <laughs> <laughs> no, my there she God. is with Roger Moore. <laughs> I love that. I be, love that. <laughs> but anyway, but the point I was getting to that, that in that thing was that everyone's late on everything. And I meant, the first one I mentioned was Reagan. Right. Said Reagan was late on AIDS. Obama was late on gay marriage. JFK was late on civil rights. Every, Lincoln said ugly things about black people before he gave his life to emancipate them. Everybody's late. But that one, the Reagan one, I purposely put that first because it was such an unnecessary one. What do you mean? He, that he didn't do anything about it until Rock Hudson got it? Yeah. Partly because it was just like, well, gay people and they shouldn't be poking in the wrong hole. Yeah, but I Bill, mean, I got to tell you, it, it, this was not, I, when you, I remember, I mean, people were getting fired from jobs. They were getting yeah. thrown out of apartments. Their families were disowning yeah. them. There was, and that's one of the reasons I, I, I love Cher so much for what she did. Right. Because she didn't buy into that fear. Right. And it was horrible. And so I remember I, you know, when I hear that about Reagan and everything else that, you know, it had to be Rock Hudson before he did anything. I mean, there were a lot of people who were liberal people. And, and part of it is honestly, part of it is they were just scared. Um, but there was a lot of meanness that that connected to I this. I remember having Ron Reagan Jr. on Politically Incorrect in the 90s. Yeah. Right under that sign there. And. Uh, Harvey Firestein was on with him, mm-hmm. and he said at one point, "Fuck you and fuck your father." And what did he say? I don't. <laughs> we'll be right back. Well, <laughs> I don't, well, I don't no, know. The reason the I reason, don't remember. The, the reason I, I say that is I don't think Ron Reagan was at all aligned with him on this. I, I I'm not sure of it. Ron Reagan Jr. Ron Reagan. He's a cool guy. Yeah. That, I'm just, my point was that the, the venom for Ronald Reagan, the president, right. was so great that Harvey could not help himself from saying, fuck you and fuck you. It's pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty funny. But okay, so here's my serious question. I hope it's not too personal, but how did you avoid this bullet? I don't know. And I think about it actually a lot now. Maybe it's in that big cup. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's it's so random. You know, it's so funny you say that. I there there it was so traumatic that I mean it really has affected me in I can every see. way for in life. Yeah. Um. It. I mean, every I mean, Kevin was thirty four, and my friends were in their twenties and thirties, and I don't know. I don't know how I avoided it, but. You know, I, what I've been thinking about it so much over the last couple of years. And, you know, one of the things, it's funny, you, know, you talk about getting older. I, I was just thinking, just the things that could happen to you from conception to death. I mean, from birth defects to, oh. you know, illness to Acc- accidents yes. to all these oh. things. If you can make it as far as we've made it, it is like 
winning the lottery. But it is like winning the lottery. And when I see all the people I know who died, and it's like, why yes. Why me? I mean, but I really mean it. It's like, I. it's hard to understand. I don't have an answer But it that. works the other way too. I remember talking to Matthew Perry last year when he was out doing his book and he did. I saw the show. Yeah, and I mean, it is harrowing what, I mean, he did it to himself, he'd be the first to admit, but the, the drugs, the operations, how close he was to death. Yeah. I mean, you know. And then once he was, I read the book too, and when he was close oh. to death, he did it again. He went back to it. Yeah. And I remember saying to him, you know, it is so easy to die. It's also kind of hard, which you prove. It is also kind of hard. And I wish you would think more of it in those terms. Yes, it is easy to die. We are so brittle, the flesh. Um, but we're also very kind of resist, resistant and hardy. I mean, you think about- But I didn't see a lot of resistant people. No. I mean, it, it was just a no, time- that, something like that, yes. Yeah, and it's but, like, you say that, but it's not hard to die. And you know, when, no, you, it's not. when you experience- It's both. All these people that you know, who are you know, in the prime of their life, and you know, because they had sex with somebody, right. it's a death sentence. And it, it, it's just incomprehensible. It is, I've never, well, I, I've just, yeah, anyway. Maybe it's my convoluted way of like getting in the idea that we've talked about before when you threaten to quit. And I'm like, first of all, you need to, you're, there's no reason to quit. There is no diminution of your skills. So why would you even think about that? You know, look at yourself as like, you know, this is, even, even though to, we're older. What do you mean to threaten to quit? What are you talking about? You've said that before, like maybe I should just. No, I said a long, well, a long. Several, retire? Several years ago, um, yeah, there was, when, when we moved over to a new company, I, I have more energy now than I've had in- Right, so in, instead of obsessing on the number, whatever you are, 71 or something. I don't obsess on that. Okay. And I'm also not afraid of dying. Well, I don't think about it. I'm, I'm fine with it. It's gonna happen. Really? It's a- That's very brave. Are you? Of dying? Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, but of the course. Reason, but dying. Yeah, but the reason I'm not is, I mean, to have lived as long as I've lived and with all the people okay. that never had that life. Well, first, it's like, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna live forever and it's kind of gravy now, well, you know? What's I, I really mean that, I'm not lying I, I, to you. I, I, I totally believe you. I'm just trying to convince you something else. <laughs> first of all, the natural lifespan of the human being is more like 100. You do realize that. How do we know this? Because there are places in the world called blue zones where people do live Almost everybody lives to around 100. It's just normal. But they don't know why. Yes, they do. No, well, they no, they, they have theories about it, exactly. But the point is that mostly it's, look, it's not rocket science. Mostly it's like the diet, you know, the lack of toxins, the lack of pollutants. There are other factors. One is a religious community, Yorba Linda in California. It's like, why? But, you know, look, that suggests to me very strongly that there is an, a mental element to keeping your health. I've always believed in a strong connection between the mind, the I, mind body I, connection. I right. so agree with you. I think it's something Western medicine completely overlooks I still. absolutely agree with if you. If they can't read it on a chart, it doesn't exist, and that is not how health is. So why do these r strongly religious people, well, religion does give people, if you really believe it, uh, if you can really throw yourself into it, it gives you peace of mind. I've heard people say to me all, all my life, you know, I put my head on the pillow at night. I know if I die in my sleep, I'll go to a better place. And I always say that, why don't you- Wait a minute, are we now, t are you now no, becoming no, no. religious, Bill? No, 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 I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying this, no, but I'm saying having that peace of mind could be a very big key to health. How, how stressed you are, how, how peace of, how when you put that head on the pillow, you go, sleep itself is so important to longevity and to being healthy. I'm just saying there are factors. That is one that should be considered since it's one of the five blue zones. But mostly it's like, another one is they all seem to eat a lot of beans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. So, you know, farting. Just could, farting. Uh, <laughs> just, well, it could be. Can, hey, can I, I want to ask you something because <laughs> I, I love, your take on religion, I, I really do. Oh, good. And you know, and you you talk about Christianity as a cult, and yes. but yet 
what you just said is really interesting. If you really believe that the peace of mind that comes along with religion lets you live longer, why don't you embrace it? Because I can't fool myself. I'm not an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not some idiot who could just go, hey. (laughs) Oh, I'm glad you're having a good time. Oh, my God. That's the best. (laughs) But it's true, you know. I always try. You're to too exp- smart for your own I always good. try to explain. Yes, yeah, so there I always try to explain to people <laughs> the difference between religion and not religion, and they say, "Well, how do you explain?" I say, "Of course, we agree that there are things in this universe that we have no way of knowing. I don't know how it all began, of course, but my answer to that is not to make up stories that I tell myself. That's your answer to that. If it works for you, congratulations, you do you. I'm, I'm saying it could be a key to longevity of sorts. You know, and I I wonder if the people in the other five places are, maybe they're not crazy religious like the Yorba Linda people. I think it's Yorba Linda, but uh, they are (laughs) possibly, you know, strong Catholics or just something where you, you know, you have that peace of mind that you know what's gonna happen when it all ends. I mean, that's one reason why you say to me, are you afraid of dying? Of course, because I don't know what's going to happen. And, and I think it's nothing, but it could be, could be anything. I'm not, uh, I've never been adamant about, I'm a, uh, about what I a certain knows. How, I don't know what happens when you die. I just, as Richard Dawkins says, I'm an atheist. You don't believe in all the other gods like Zeus and, you know, Thor. I just take it one more and don't believe in the last one we, were, we agreed to uh, believe in. So... <sighs> But you're peaking. Is the, the point I was making is that you should think of yourself as peaking. You know, don't listen to those kids who th- say you're old. And no, but you think this is affecting me. You're the one who raised retirement. No, I raised retirement uh, three years ago with you. And it Not had that to, long ago. Yeah, no, it was. It, ha- it really? hasn't been the last couple of years. Oh, good. I'm, I'm right. so, I'll tell you, I'm like so energized now. Oh, with this, good. Uh, because and, we're getting, I really mean it, we're getting resources. Yes. I have, I've got this passion for these right. documentaries. And this is what is going to keep you alive. I mean, you don't... No, that's with the, the mind... Right. And also can, having a purpose to to get up and like new things, new experiences, new worlds I, I, I'm to with you. conquer. I, I'm with you. No, I'm totally <laughs> okay. with you. You're right. I mean, right. I didn't know you were going to expose me that way. Oh, I'm sorry. It's well, okay. We can, we can no, cut it. it, it uh, no, it's fine. It's absolutely true. I was, I I was getting really frustrated, you know, uh, over some circumstances corporately, but it's changed. And I'm, I, I'm more excited about what we're doing than I've been in 17 years here. I'm really, really charged about this. I I don't know how we didn't become friends before we did. I know. And I'm going to probably die soon. And then all of a sudden it's like, God, I could have been friends with him for like 20 years. I love the way you taunted me with that one. You thought you were going to get me go right back into my spiel. No, no, no. I'm not that. I may look dumb, but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. Our paths never really did cross, but. Well, they did once. They did once. Oh, you don't even know it. Not good. They're, no, it oh. was, um, I don't know if you remember. You oh. want to talk about how yeah. things have changed. I want to test your memory and see okay. if you remember this. The night at the Ramrod, I was very drunk. No, it wasn't the <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going in. I thought I was, I honestly thought I was going into the IHOP. Uh, and then things, no. didn't, then things just got out of control. I'll tell you what it was. I, I want to say, I want to you know what? Not a guy named Ben. <laughs> no, I, stop it. <laughs> I owe him like 20 bucks. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> there was a t-shirt I saw. I was in like Croatia and there was a t-shirt that said, um, I'm not gay, but 50 bucks is 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so I don't know if you remember this. This must have been... Uh, in the mid '90s, maybe <laughs> um, there was some kind of a thing um, downtown, and it was a big event. And I think it was honoring lawyers or something. <laughs> well, all I can say is, in the '90s, you were I would there. go do anything. You were there <laughs> yes. with a woman, and I remember somebody <laughs> said, "Oh my God, Bill Maher's over there." And I looked, and I thought, "Wow, Bill Maher's there." Oh, and 
Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but this <laughs> I will I will tell you this because this is uh, this is insane. It's gonna be bad. Do you remember a judge? Because you were there. There was a judge who got up and spoke, and the judge decided he wanted to be a comic. And he told a joke oh. about a guy who was dating this girl and uh, this woman or whatever, and um, they were in bed, and he said something to her or did something, and she said, God, you are you remind me of a pedophile. <laughs> and he said, that's an awfully big word for a 13 year old. <laughs> Do you, you were there. And I remember people gasped. Uh, really? But the judge, nothing ever happened. I love that. Nothing, that's just, ev that's nothing a, ever that's happened. That's a great show. You were there. I don't remember. But as I say, in the nineties, I was that guy who the old line, he'd go to the opening of an envelope. You know, it was just like, it was that first, Again, your theory, you were right. Your first flush of getting invited to things was pretty great. You know, yeah. like, oh, you're now in the celebrity club and you get to, what, sit on the sidewalk downtown and listen to a judge tell a bad joke. It was <laughs> just, but, but it was some event, right? It was some It was event. some big event. It was a big event. And, and I, I remember I thinking, God, invited, Bill Maher. Yeah, and, wow. you know, Bill Maher, when he was in high school, didn't get invited to the party. So like, our college was a total wipeout and socially. And that's the secret to life, that... You know, that charge you get, you can't duplicate with a bigger house no. or another car. No. So what you got to do is you got to find new things. Yes. And that to me is the secret is that, you know, it's like for me, yep. these documentaries, I have such a passion for this. And we're creating a scripted show and a game show and everything. And I love doing these new things. And you do this. Too. This. Uh, this. What we're doing right now. What you're right doing now right now. It's only a year old and it's a new thing and it's a great thing. And that's I'm what keeps you young. Yes. No, you're pre <laughs> Wait, you're reading my lines. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, we, if we're gonna, uh, if we're coming to an end, yes. we're showing that we agree on things. We we agree on. I, I mean, the, the the times when you and I, it's just we've only had one big argument. It's a pussy hairs difference. <laughs> <laughs> My, no. What? No, we've had one big argument, and we that's did? it. Yeah, on what? The Beatles. The Beatles, but it's oh, well, that's hysterical that you. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, well, it's. I, I don't know how you look at that documentary and don't see the love between Lennon and McCartney. No, I, I saw the love there, oh. but I don't know how you read the book that I told you to read here, there, and everywhere I, and not understand that there was a bird's eye view this guy had that was very different. But he's also a guy who had an ax to grind. Why? Uh, because, well, I asked, I asked Martin Lewis, the ultimate Beatle expert about that. So I can't share everything, but let's just say that there is, <clears throat> there. I mean... Look, he, he's selling a book. People want to say things that will make other people buy the book. Let's just leave it at that. I mean, I don't take the guy's word as gospel. And oh, I didn't did, take it as and gospel. And his memory from all those years ago. If, if it's true, then somehow they like went through a phase where they didn't love each other so much. And then by the time we actually saw it, because I'm going to believe my lion eyes more than what I read in a book, my lion eyes saw eight hours or what was it? 10 hours? No, it was like 40 hours. Oh, they, they, they shot, they, they we, shot it for 40, saw. but we saw <clears throat> Right. Okay. Of jo I, I, I get it. Of John Lennon and Paul McCartney, who it was so obviously that band always was them. That was, it was Lennon and McCartney. I mean, they, there was that thing that Ringo and George, second class Beatles, you know, I didn't know how true that was. It is kind of true. When George Harrison threatened to quit, Paul and John had lunch. We, we didn't see that thing. They just had the audio. But they don't go, oh, how can we get our mate back in the band? They were immediately throwing him under the bus and talking about getting Eric Clapton in there. Um, there's a reason why George quit and Ringo quit at one point. It's... They're like talk. They're singing to each other. They're laughing with each other. John completely ignores Yoko. It's like she's not even there. He's so much they more, brought a bed into the studio, right? Because so she, she could just be there, but he ignores her. But he he and Paul McCartney, you can see it in their eyes. They have this incredible connection. I would think that you would want to embrace that. I want to embrace oh. it. Let's watch it together. I, 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 <laughs> really, I haven't seen it. I saw it once. I want to see it again. I would watch it again. Let's make a day to watch that like in a year I, or something. I loved but not that in documentary. One, I don't think in one night we can. <laughs> <laughs> but we could do it like every 
we could do it like every, let's do it every one night, pick a night in a month. I would and totally do like that. Every Friday night, we'll watch two hours. You're not suggesting I don't like the Beatles, are no, you? I no, no. Love, I I'm love telling, the no Beatles. No kidding. We, yes, that's the rock on which we found our church. <laughs> 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 All right. I know this is past your bedtime. So it I'm is. Gonna... <laughs> I so appreciate uh, it. You. And oh. I'll do your Christmas show if you still want me to. Oh, you're booked. Okay. You're booked. And the, the kids won't be mean to oh, me. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> really? What, I can't wait. Are going to attack me? Oh, no. Oh.